Good evening and welcome to Your Right to Know by the Fitchburg Republican City Committee. My name is Mary Lotz and I will be your host for this evening's show. Last month in May, we had a great discussion with Sheriff Lou Evangelides, our High Sheriff of Worcester County, who came to us and in part, one of his many topics that he spoke about was the opioid problem and the opioid addiction. And this is such a timely prod, uh, problem right now in our communities that we thought we would follow up on it. So working with Sheriff Lou in the Worcester County Department, we have invited Sean McKenna. Sean is the Community Outreach Coordinator for the Worcester County Sheriff's Office. Sean has been on with us before, and we welcome you back, Sean, to talk about the opioid problem and the opioid addiction in our area. Thank you so much for having me back. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a very hot topic right now. It's a difficult topic to speak on, very personal for a lot of families, not only here in Worcester County, but throughout the country. But it's a very important product, uh, subject matter that we need to discuss and hopefully get that out to the community. It is, and, and because it's such a hot topic and problematic topic mm. to talk about, an issue that is impacting, I think you articulated earlier, families nobody is not touched by it and if you've not been touched right now you will be in yeah. a very short period of time unfortunately the statistical data it's up in massachusetts about 273 percent across mm -hmm. the board cuts across every socioeconomic background every group every age does discriminate between race color creed or religion we're seeing it in every single community here in worcester county and across the state of massachusetts now sheriff lou uh, is my understanding, you of course have worked with Sheriff Lou for years, but he's pivoted once again into a new program mm. that has you as outward, outreach coordinator going out into the communities and talking about a very specific ax, um, aspect of the opioid epidemic. And I'm going to title this, although please correct me, but I'm titling this night's episode is protecting your home, your family environment from drug abuse and crimes of opportunity. Absolutely. Because yeah. I think this is exactly where we're, where we are now. People need to know the signs and protect themselves, their homes, their families themselves. That's correct. From Mary. these crimes. So I'd like you to talk about what made this new aspect of the outreach mm -hmm. come into effect and uh, and then talk about what who you speak to absolutely we saw over the last three years in particular a tremendous increase in the unintentional opioid overdoses and deaths here in the state of mm -hmm. Massachusetts we have various public safety initiatives that we bring to every single community group here in Worcester County we wanted to put together a program specifically gauged uh, towards protecting the uh, citizens of Worcester County and letting them know how the heroin epidemic is related to opioid pain medication. Mm -hmm. So we thought it would be very important to impart some knowledge about how you properly dispose of this medication, if it's around the house, and also how you can protect it within your home in mm -hmm. case somebody is seeking that medication mm -hmm. to facilitate their addiction. And that's really where we target it. We target it across, of course, all county lines um, and also to every single individual here in Worcester County because it is affecting so many communities. Right. So not only the senior population, but also parents, also uncles and aunts and children. We go into the schools and talk about this topic as well, because we just need to make sure that everyone is aware of it. There is a new face of addiction, and anything that the community can do to help law enforcement, that's really what's going to drive the unintentional deaths down. Mm -hmm. mm. When you go and speak to different groups, maybe senior groups or different community groups, what is their reception to this problem? Are they shocked? They are shocked, yeah. Some of our, some are afraid. Some, a lot of them say, I didn't realize the problem was this big. I saw it in the newspaper, I heard about it on the radio, but I didn't realize that it was happening here in yeah. this community. Yeah. One of the, the biggest stereotypes is that people will think, oh, there's no drugs in my community, right? That happens somewhere else. That happens in the big city or that happens in the poor neighborhoods. 
not the opioid crisis. It really is in every single town and city mm -hmm. here in Massachusetts. So once we start to talk to these people and let them know that you may be, unbeknownst to you, enabling somebody, enabling their addiction because you have opioid pain medication in the house that is not secured, they really are taken aback and they really start to think, oh my goodness, have, has someone taken advantage of me? I can't believe that I'm contributing to this epidemic. Right, yeah. I'm thinking that when you said in the community, but actually we're looking at, it's maybe in my family. That's and right. I may be con contributing to something in my own family. That's right. and, um, and so that must bring a different level because now we're looking at grandma or even parents being part of the drug chain that they probably never thought about. That's right, exactly. It's, some, it's not like with, with cocaine or it's not like LSD or ecstasy where you have opioid pain medication that is legally prescribed to individuals because of an ailment. They have these drug products legally inside their house, sure. inside their medicine cabinet that people are now exploiting and taking advantage of because they either have an addiction problem or because of the high street value. Right. They wanna sell. get their hands on those pills so they can sell them and make some income. So what are some of the things that people need to look out for in their home? Absolutely. The first thing and one of the basic things I would say is make sure that medication is not piling up inside your house. A lot of the times you go, you have your wisdom teeth out, you maybe have been in a sports accident, you'll get 30 pills right mm -hmm. up front from a physician, from a pharmacist. Especially in the old days. Especially in the old days, right? 30 days have this amount of medication and usually people will take one or two or three, maybe four pills mm -hmm. and they have 25, 26 pills that are left over. Most of the time, those will just sit in the medicine cabinet and then something else will happen and now you'll have some more medication and some more medication and it builds up. And a lot of the times people will tell us, I forgot I may have had mm -hmm. Percocet in the house or mm -hmm. I forgot I had Oxycontin in the house. My child had their wisdom teeth out five years ago. I just forgot to dispose of it. And it's sitting there and the problem is, is that if you, first of all, don't realize that it's there and also you have multiple dosages, you have these pills bu uh, building up, it's very hard to do a survey and to do and to make sure that you are tracking that medication. If someone starts to take it from underneath your nose, you may have no idea how many pills they've taken, sure. how many pills they've used. So you really wanna take an inventory of your medication mm -hmm. as well. And you wanna make sure that it's secured either in a locked desk drawer, in a locked medicine cabinet, in a locked bedside table. Uh, it's sad we have to think this way, but any other barrier that you can put in place that makes it harder for somebody to get their hands on that medication is all the best. And it's gonna reduce those unintentional overdoses on the street. If we'll say parents, grandparents invite people over, family members over for a holiday or something like that, mm -hmm. is there an age bracket that people need to be aware of? So I, you know, I don't have to be worried about my toddlers, but I do have to be worried about my 12 year olds or. Right, right. Statistically, the new numbers were just released for the past, for 2015. Mm -hmm. And what we have seen, the largest spike in overdoses and deaths is within that 25 to 35 age range. However, the second highest is 35 to 45, and the really? next highest is 14 to 20. So I would say anywhere between 14 to 40 are the individuals that you may have to be concerned about. Not to say that everybody that comes over to your house is a pill seeker or sure. has an addiction problem, but you know, if someone's spending an ornament a long time in the bathroom, if they disappear, if you find them maybe up in your bedroom, going through your things, trying to find medication, that's certainly a red flag that you wanna be very uh, cautious of. One of the things I was at um, Health Alliance had a family day fair uh, mm -hmm. a few weeks ago and I went. And one of the displays they had was the similarity between certain pills. And they weren't just speaking about narcotic pills, mm -hmm. but they were talking about all kinds of pills and candy. Absolutely. And how pills and candy to a child, a youngster, would oftentimes look like M&Ms or gummy bears or something like that. So I think, is there a rule of thumb, keep everything out of the sight of family members? Your pills don't belong where any visitors can spot them? Right, yeah, that's probably the safest way to operate. Um, long gone are the days of the walls of privacy where some, mm -hmm. someone would never think about going and looking in your medicine cabinet. Unfortunately, those days are long gone. We've done um, task forces and talks with real estate agents who say they have to protect and watch out who comes into their open oh, houses. sure. Because now people are going in to try to find medication in an open house. Mm -hmm. uh, and especially where pills do come in all shapes, sizes, and colors, can look just like candy. If you're looking to dispose of your medication, you, now you can't flush it down the toilet anymore, but one way you can get rid of your medication is by disposing of it through the trash. 
And I always recommend if you're gonna use that option, make sure that you grind that medication up and you mix it with some undesirable substance like kitty litter, ground coffee beans, and wrap it up in a napkin and throw it into the garbage. Because if someone is suffering from an opioid addiction, they don't care if it's sitting right there in the trash, they'll reach in and they'll sure. take it. But also just because uh, what you intimated, if you have children in the house and they see that, they may think it's candy and reach in to try to get that. Sure. I still say the best way to dispose of your medication in here in Fitchburg, there's a tremendous um, resource to the citizens in, of the city. You can bring it to the police station oh. and they have a kiosk right there in the police station so you can bring your medication. It looks like a mailbox. You just deposit it right there and then the police will properly dispose of it. Mm -hmm. That way it doesn't build up inside your house. Are there myths about drug abuse? And I think of you know, I'm a grandparent and I look and I, you know, my children, my grandchildren would never, right. would never take drugs. Exactly. I and mean, that's for some other community, right. some other family. Are that's, there myths? Of course, that's how the majority safety? of people think, you know, especially if you are in a safer community, if you've never experienced drug addiction on a personal level, you always think that that's just happening mm -hmm. in some far off place, usually in an inner city somewhere. But the reality is that's not the case. When we look at statistically the data, 70% of people that get their hands on these opioids medication get it from a friend or a family member. Mm -hmm. They're not going down and finding the drug dealer in the alleyway somewhere. They're taking it right from the medicine cabinet or it's being sold to them from a friend or a family member or the grandparent of a friend. So these, these situations occur in every single community. So those, I would say that's the biggest myth. Everyone always thinks it's not in my community. Right. There's no drugs here. That's in some other town, that's in some other city. But unfortunately, if you talk to your local police who do a tremendous job, they'll tell you that, yeah, we do have problems here. And a lot of the problems are related to some sort of substance abuse, drug issue. Um, one of the judges here in Worcester County said, if we could only solve the drug crisis, we could shut our courtrooms down. We could turn them into movie theaters because it contributes to so many other things, whether it be domestic violence, breaking and entering, um, loitering, all sorts of other crimes are ancillary to the fact that uh, you know there's drug addiction out there. Well, I think Sheriff Lou, when he was on last month, one of the statistics that was very frightening and disconcerting was that he said 90% of his the inmates at the Worcester House of Correction, County House of Correction and Jail System, 90% are in because of drug-related crimes. That's correct. And, yeah. and, and I'd like the viewers to know these are not, there's another myth that's out there is I was caught with a one joint and, mm. and that's what got me into jail. And that's not the case. These are people who are committing crimes because of their addictions. Absolutely. And their need to sell. That's right. um, I know, you know, oftentimes addictions take people out of a normal way of thinking. Mm. And some of the things that I, I read in the paper recently, and, and there's no lack of, of this kind of information being put out there, but there was a case in Westfield, Massachusetts, where a young couple, users, and they had a toddler, and they left their paraphernalia around the house because this was normal behavior for them. They used mm -hmm. openly, they cleaned apparatus openly, and they just left a lot of things around the house, and the toddler got into them. How do you approach situations, or how do you instruct people on approaching situations like this, which are almost untenable? Yeah. If grandparents come upon this or parents see their children, they don't want to turn them into social services because they don't want the family dis destroyed. They don't want to lose their relationship with their grandchildren. They feel if they ignore it, mm. maybe it'll go away. How do you instruct about situations like that? Right. Whenever you're talking about an addiction, the easiest way to turn someone's life around and to get them on the straight and narrow is when you have early intervention, when you address that addiction problem up front. Now, that response and that way of thinking is understandable. They don't want to lose their mm -hmm. grandchild. They don't want to lose their child to social services. However, think about what you're doing if you're allowing that young child to remain in a situation where they are not safe. You may want to keep them in the house, you may want to keep the house together, but however, there are cases when accidental overdoses do occur. That child may die. That's the whole, that's the other end of the spectrum. And by thinking that it's just going to go away, if you speak to anybody that has recovered from an addiction, they will always tell you that is a tough road to walk and it's a tough thing to shake. So to think that somehow magically one day the situation is going to change, 
nine times out of 10 in the vast majority, it's not. It's only gonna get worse as they start mm -hmm. to run out of money. They start to become more dependent on others and they're looking for other means to facilitate their addiction. Unfortunately, that child's gonna take a back seat to the wellness and to the addiction mm -hmm. and they could be in a serious, serious med medical issue. So if you do see those signs, although you wanna protect your family, you certainly wanna let law enforcement and the social service agencies make them aware of it because you really, that's what the best thing can be done for that child. What do you feel or do you support people or do you educate them in keeping Narcan in their ha households if they live with uh, someone who has a, an addiction or a problem? Yeah, here in Massachusetts there's a blank script for Narcan so you, as long as you're trained on it you can get a prescription for home use Narcan. Mm -hmm. And Narcan is a wonder drug. There's no doubt that it certainly works and it has saved people. It's opioid specific and it doesn't work every single time but Narcan is most effective when it's administered early on in the overdose uh, because after four minutes of improper oxygenation to the brain, you're doing irreversible brain damage. So that's why a lot of police officers will carry Narcan now because they'll get to the house before the paramedics arrive. If you are worried about somebody, it is a good thing to have in the house uh, because you'll probably find them first and you can administer it and give them the best chance of survival. Mm -hmm. Narcan, though, there are some limitations to Narcan. It wears out after about 30 minutes. Um, every time it's administered doesn't mean it's going to work. You have heroin that's laced with um, illegal fentanyl and other drugs that you administer Narcan five, six, seven times. It doesn't matter. They're not going to come back. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, Narcan does not solve the addiction problem. Sure. It just brings them back from an overdose state. But I would certainly encourage, if you are worried about somebody, definitely speak with your physician, your primary care physician, and learn what your options are because Narcan could be a very valuable tool in saving somebody's life. Mm -hmm. Another drug which many people don't look at it as a drug or an opioid because it was always used to help people was mm -hmm. methadone. Yeah. And methadone was a drug that was sanctioned years ago to help people get off a heroin addiction or an opioid addiction and yet that too has compounded the problem. Mm. Uh, it's out there in the community and most recently again there was an article in the newspaper of a grandmother who hid methadone in a baby bottle. The baby woke up in the middle of the night, was crying for some food, somebody went to the refrigerator, got out the baby bottle and fed the baby the methadone. Now fortunately it had a, a positive ending for the child. Narcan was used by medical personnel but you know I think that the problem is drugs are all around us mm. and because of its availability it's lost that stigma of hiding fear and we almost just leave it out there for people to see and get at nowadays. I think it's a good observation. I think it's like anything. When you talk about opioid pain medication, that can be a lifesaver for somebody mm -hmm. if it's properly used for its intended purpose and under the doctor's supervision. However, it's when you take things like this opioid pain medication or methadone and you use it for the wrong reasons, that's when you see somebody that can develop a serious addiction. I mean, you can develop an addiction under a doctor's care as well, mm -hmm. but hopefully that physician is monitoring how you are responding to this medication and maybe they will make a treatment treatment adjustment to make sure that you do not go down the road of addiction. But when it's used for unintended purposes, that's when you have a serious problem. Now methadone is one of those things that it's, it's used to replace somebody's dependence mm -hmm. on heroin. And methadone is going to take about four hours to kick in and hopefully you gradually wean somebody off of right. using the opioid just like you would use a nicotine patch for somebody that smokes cigarettes. However, if it's not done under the proper care, and under the proper drug regimen, someone may replace their heroin addiction with a methadone, methadone addiction. So because methadone is an opioid at the end of the day. So you have to be very careful. It's like so many things in life. As long as someone is properly monitoring the situation, that's when you have the highest, greatest uh, chance of success. I heard of a, a, a terrible case, and but unfortunately I think this happens all too frequently, of elder people who are legitimately given a certain amount of pain medicine for term end stage diseases, mm. terminal illness, whatever, and then somehow their home gets marked as having narcotics in it and then they become victims. Mm -hmm. um, 
is there anything that people can do? Is there something that they can outreach to their local police departments, or is there any other things that they can do to yeah. protect themselves in their homes? Right, properly securing that medication, um, first and foremost. Be careful of the people that are closest to you. As I talked about that statistic, 70% of individuals get it from a friend or a family member. So be careful what medication you leave lying around the house. A lot of people will have those pill uh, trays that have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday blocked Three o'clock, five o'clock. Exactly, and if you overload those trays, it can be very easy for somebody to come in and victimize you, take your medication. Also be careful about what conversations you have out in public. Um, when you leave the, the pharmacy, make sure that you're not saying that you're taking home a prescription for codeine. You don't know who's listening. You don't know who's around mm -hmm. in that pharmacy or out in that parking lot. You may be broadcasting that information out to someone that will come and sure. try to victimize sure. you. So be careful the conversations you have in public. Be careful what you post on the internet, um, what you show on the internet, and who has that information because they may uh, volunteer that information to other people that are looking to get their hands on that medication. So you do have to approach it differently now, unfortunately, mm -hmm. because we're in the wake of this crisis. Just be careful what information you volunteer, uh, voluntarily give over to somebody. I know one of the uh, things that I read in the paper the other day in doing a little research about this is another big issue is elder abuse. Mm -hmm. And I, I wish I could quickly find here, but the uh, Massachusetts Home Care uh, a lot of people know that as uh, MHC. Their elder abuse reports from 2014 to 2015, they had 77 reports of elder abuse a month. And in the following year, that 2015 to 2016, and we're not even in a full year yet, they're now averaging 91 reports per month of elder abuse. And this is another area where elders, not just with family members, but become victims. And could you talk a little bit about this? Because elder people in need of medicine and pain medicines, they're, they're really at almost like stealing candy from a baby, in other words. Right, yeah, it's a serious issue that's out there. Unfortunately, those numbers, as you just intimated, uh, are rising across the county. And a lot of the times what will happen is you'll become a victim because of intimidation. There are cases of um, people putting hands on their grandparents, beating them up, firing guns off into the air to scare them, to give over their medication, threatening them. You have to remember you're dealing with somebody that has an addiction problem. They may be very desperate, they may be strung out, they may be detoxing, which can be very stressful situations. And they could be at their wit's end and they're looking to get that high again, they're looking to get to their happy place. And they'll do anything, they don't care mm -hmm. who you are. So you have to be very careful, remember your own personal safety first. Never try to argue with them, never try to fight with them. Just get yourself into a safe position and then let the police know. Mm -hmm. Maybe when they're outside of the house, when they're gone away for the day. Let someone know. Um, you don't have to be a silent victim. Certainly there are resources out there, not only to help yourself, but to help your grandson, to help your niece, to help that person that may be the victimizing you because of their addiction. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a serious problem and a lot of the times I think the senior population is afraid to speak up. They're afraid to call 911 because they're very independent. They don't mm -hmm. want to trouble the police. They don't want to trouble the fire department. That's exactly what we're here for, for your personal safety. We'll do anything to help you, and you don't have to live like that. There are other options out there. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't really want to get into marijuana and the potential change in, in legalization for that, but do you believe that if marijuana is legalized, now one of the statistics, again, that I was re reading is that currently today in Massachusetts, there's 24,200 people approximately in the state of Massachusetts that have legal prescriptions for marijuana. Mm -hmm. It's been legalized, what, two years now maybe? Um, do you see, I know a lot of people don't believe that marijuana is a gateway drug, so I don't want to go there. But we will say now that marijuana will be found in many more homes mm -hmm. in the coming months. Do you see any other issue in terms of this new substance being introduced into most households as increasing the problem? I think it's part of the larger problem, whether we're talking about opioids, whether we're talking about cocaine, whether we're talking about marijuana. 
Does everyone that smoke marijuana all become a heroin addict? No, of course not. But are you at an increased likelihood to maybe try another type of drug? It all really stems around what type of addictive properties do you have personally and the group of people that you hang around with. Mm -hmm. We find talking to people within the jail, talking to other people that are now clean, that go around and give speeches on addiction and about an abusive lifestyle, a lot of them will say, well, I started smoking marijuana and the other people in my company, they'll say, well, why don't you try cocaine today? Or maybe you should try these pills. And it, it breeds from itself because of that. Now, there are medical uses for marijuana. I think the science has been tested on that with people with cancer especially, um, certain seizures dis disorders, mm -hmm. it helps them. However, just as we were talking about with pain medication under a doctor's care, uh, I think if you look at other states across the country that have fully legalized it, there have been people that have manipulated the system. They've taken advantage of the fact that you know, you can't sleep here, have a marijuana card. You have toe pain here, have a marijuana card. Mm -hmm. um, and looking at the science, the science isn't settled yet. And also we're looking at different forms of marijuana. It's not the same type of pot that was around in the 60s. You have highly concentrated forms of butane honey oil and hash oil that can be smoked, that it's odorless, it's vaporless um, in vaping pens. And that is getting people in serious medical situations because they don't even realize what they're putting into their body. They think it's just regular marijuana and it's very highly concentrated forms of THC. And that is sending them to the hospital. Um, it's, it's knocking them to the ground because it's very potent, mm -hmm. it's very powerful. So I think just like any drug that comes out to the market, we have to be very careful and realize that maybe even though the state is now sanctioning it, there's gonna be an underground market for it that's gonna to try to undercut the prices of mm -hmm. what the government is taxing, that's certainly taxing the, it at. Uh, Colorado experience. Is seeing that now, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. So we have to be very careful. There are no thresholds with like alcohol, you know, 0.08, you're over the limit to drive a vehicle. What is the threshold for marijuana? There has not been one established yet. Maybe there will be in the future. Mm -hmm. But I think there are a lot of unintended consequences that states like Washington and Colorado did not necessarily bank on, and now they're seeing that because of sure. what they did on the marijuana. It's gonna be put on the ballot, so certainly the, the voters within Massachusetts will have to make that decision for themselves. I know within law enforcement, we do see that it leads to other problems, and I think we should be very, very careful before mm -hmm. we fully legalize it here in the state of Massachusetts. Our, our show is over, believe already? it or not, wow. already. <laughs> uh, but I really want to thank you for coming in today, Sean, and uh, thank the Sheriff's Department for allowing you to come in and, and certainly for having this program, which I think is extremely vital for people. If any of our viewers want to contact you, to come in, to give a presentation to a group, a Boy Scout group, an elder group, Absolutely. a senior center, a community group. What is the best way to get you to come out? They could certainly send me an email at S. McKenna, that's S-M-C-K-E-N-N-A, at S-D-W, dot state dot ma dot us rather lengthy email address or they can call the community outreach division of the sheriff's office at 508-459-9064 we'd be happy to come out to any group just to impart this information and hope that those people will spread it throughout the community and that will make everyone safer in the end it is a serious issue it is a critical issue and i always think of one of sheriff lou's parting words uh, on our show last month um, I don't know if it actually made it to the ta to the taping or if he told me afterwards, but he says, if people say, I don't know anyone now, in five years, everyone will know somebody who has been severely impacted by opioid abuse. And, you know, I just pray for people out there and families and parents and grandparents because this is a devastating problem that's life-threatening and life-ending. And I thank you so much for coming. And we thank you for watching Your Right to Know and sitting in with us tonight with the Fitchburg Republican City Committee. As we leave you, we want you to remember that your local city and town Republican Committee is your only grassroots organization that supports and holds dear your liberty, your constitutional rights, and conservative values. We encourage you to join us. Why? Because to us, the GOP stands for growth, opportunity and prosperity and because we always stand for freedom. Thank you and good night. Free.
deserves all her rights and goes forth in power and might that reflects our values and preserves our rights and goes forth in power and might.